Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sounds good. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's research seminar. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffitt, and I am the research program manager at the Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon. Um, I will be your host for today's event. Um, before we get started, just a few logistics. Um, your mics and cameras and screen shares have been turned off for this event. Um, please help us out by keeping them off for now. Um, and if you would like to ask questions, which we do encourage, please use the chat box, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and we'll get to those questions at the end. Um, wanted to also let everyone know that we will be recording uh, today's talk and we'll be putting it up on the HMSC website under past seminars. So if you would like to share this with any of your colleagues um, that are unable to join us today, uh, give me a few days and I'll get that up um, and please share that. Um, just a couple of quick announcements before we get started. I uh, wanted to just do a little plug for next week's seminar. Um, on June 11th, we have Kyle Newman, who will be joining us um, from UC Santa Barbara. Um, he's going to talk about some new research tools that he developed um, to look at terrestrial runoff and the health of French Polynesian reefs. Um, so come join us for that. The other thing that's happening right after seminar that day is um, the Stories of Plastic which is a movie that is going to be followed by a panel for question and answer, um, is going to be hosted by Surfrider and supported by HMSC's, HMSC's green team. Um, so uh, watch out for announcements for that if you'd like to join. Um, I will be sending out a reminder on Monday. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is that we are still looking for seminar speakers to keep this virtual seminar series going over the summer this year. So if you have anybody that you work with um, that might be interested, no matter where they're at in the world, um, go ahead and connect me with them and we'll see if we can get some interesting folks um, to join us for seminar this summer. But for what we have today, um, I want to introduce today's speaker, um, Craig Nori. Hang on, let me pull up his bio here. Um, he is our speaker for today, and he completed his uh, bachelor's at the University of Tego in New Zealand. He then moved up to Auckland to complete his master's and PhD, which he defended in 2019. Craig is now a postdoc with Jessica's Miller's lab um, with Kuhn stationed at HMSC. And he has had an interesting start to being here at Hatfield, um, as most of his time has actually been not at Hatfield and remote. Um, so I'm really excited that he has decided to join us for our seminar today um, and hopefully uh, is the beginning of connecting with all of us um, for those he hasn't connected with yet. So Craig, I'm gonna turn this over to you, um, give you the mic and let you take it from here. And thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, thanks for coming along, everyone. Um, especially with everything that's going on, I know a lot of you might be a bit distracted. Hopefully this is a welcome distraction from everything that's going on. So hopefully you're all tucked up away inside. So today I'm going to be just talking about some of the work that I did for my PhD, which I finished up at the end of last year, um, and some of the stuff that I did before flying across the ocean and getting here about a month before the planet went slightly mad. Um, one of the last times I gave this talk was actually during my PhD defense and one of the exam committee fell asleep. So I'll try my best to make it a little bit more exciting than it was for that guy. Um, so first of all, I just got to start off by thanking the huge amount of help that I've had from these people from different organizations. So. Brendan Dunphy and Carolyn Lundquist from the University of Auckland. And Carolyn gets, uh, gets on there twice because she's actually got a co-appointment with NEWA. So that's the New Zealand National Institute of Water and Atmosphere. Um, and Norman Ragg from Hawthorne Institute, which is an independent research institute based in New Zealand. And Maninia Rohan and Simon Witt from MedOcean Solutions. So that's the, the Oceanographic Division of New Zealand Meteorological Service. So the work that I was doing for my PhD was set in this global context of global bilateral aquaculture 
really started to increase over the last few decades. So you can see from the, from the 90s that this really starts to, to take off. Especially, and I think it's a really nice contrast compared to that wild capture fisheries in this figure, which have remained relatively constant. So this worldwide trend in this increasing bivalve aquaculture, it's often seen as a way, as a relatively low impact way to meet the protein needs of a growing human population. So it's probably something that's going to be continue to increase worldwide. And this occurs mainly in coastal areas. So that's going to increase the interactions that aquaculture is going to be having with the environment. Um, at the same time as we're seeing this global increase in aquaculture, these wild or natural bivalve reefs have been absolutely destroyed. So you can see on this map, which just which is just demonstrating some of the oyster reefs around the world. There's not a huge amount of blue on there, which is good. Well, blue is good. It's not good. There's not a huge amount of blue on there. Uh, most of this, and there's a lot of brown and red on there. So we're having this increase in bivalve aquaculture, but this decrease in these natural bivalve groups. And as we're losing these bivalve reefs globally, we don't realize exactly how important they were with all the ecosystem services that they provide and the ecosystem function they support. So there's been also at the same time as this, there's an increase in restoration efforts worldwide to try and bring back a lot of these lost ecosystem functions and to try and restore what's been lost with varying degrees of success. So this is also the case in New Zealand, where I did most of this work, or all of this work. Just in case you're not too sure where that is, just straight across the Pacific, down to the bottom from the Pacific Northwest to the Southwest Pacific. And this work has been done in the Perth of Thames, Hauriki Gulf area in northern New Zealand. So it's at the top of, near the top of the North Island and the country's biggest city, Auckland, is actually located just in this area here adjacent to where this work was done. Uh, the Perth of Thames is this uh, U-shaped area here, to be specific. It's a, this coastal embayment that's about 30 kilometers across, about 50 kilometers wide. In, so in this, this area used to support these dense mussel populations. So from here on in, when I'm talking about mussels, I'm going to be talking about these Greenland mussels, Perna canaliculus. So they're an endemic New Zealand species and that used to occur in this area. Everybody's favorite mussel fact is the fact that they can filter a bathtub's worth of water every day. Depends on how big your bathtub is as to how much that is, but it's around 350 to 400 liters as a figure that gets tossed around. And they're really important to provide these ecosystem services. They provide 3D habitat structure, water filtration, benthopelagic coupling, nutrient removal. So they're really important um, in creating this biogenic habitat. For a number of species as well. So until the late 60s, the entire, well, a lot of the Horeki Gulf Perth of Thames area, like you can see on that green map, was covered by dense beds of these greenland mussels. So everywhere in green there were mussel beds on that map on the left, um, and the darker green just demonstrates where they were really dense. So, and those dark green areas were when they were really dense beds. Um, we'd like to dream that they all look like that figure at the bottom right, but there were probably a lot more. Um, there was probably a lot more space between those mussels. But either way, they were an important, important species in that area. So that that area supported a dredge fishery for those mussels. Um, so they used to have these, these vessels that would cruise along backwards and forwards 
dredging up dredging up the seafloor and pulling these pulling these muscles out. So you can see in the center picture one of the dredges that they used to use, um, and obviously that just ripped up the seafloor as well as pulling out these greenland mussels. A lot of other shellfish beds were destroyed. So we lost a lot of horse muscle beds as well, and it's something else that they know has gone missing. And what happened is a lot of these muscles, these muscles were put into cans and shipped overseas. Now this is what happened. So this is probably something we've all seen before, and I hate to say it, but it's probably the sort of thing that we're all going to see again at some point in the future. So if you just look at this, the solid black line, so that's demonstrating the, the landings of these Greenland mussels from the 1920s in tons. So you can see how it continues steadily increasing through the first half of the 20th century. Get to the 1960s and it hits a peak, followed by this collapse in these populations. So currently in that Birth of Thames Horikiga area, these Greenland mussels are functionally extinct. What we do have is aquaculture for this very same species in this area. So these blue squares on the map on the left demonstrate where there's aquaculture for this species happening. So the system that's mainly used is this backbone muscle system. So we've got the, the backbone ropes that you can see going along here. Hopefully you can see where my mouse is. Um, and then muscles are grown off dropper ropes that you can see coming off here. So when you look at that map on the left and compare it to that previous green map, you can see that there's a huge amount that's been lost and this covers nowhere near what that used to cover, what used to be covered in green muscles. So there's actually a growing effort to restore all these muzzle populations that have been lost. So what's happened is a lot of commercial bags of mussels have been bought, take them out on one of these barges and throw them over the side. There's, at the moment, there's big goals that have been put in by the, in the area of restoring I think it's a thousand hectares of generic shellfish beds in this area, just to try and restore some of what's been lost. But for any of these restoration programs to be successful, for, it, for, well, for any population to be successful, it needs to be able to sustain itself. It's pointless going and throwing these mussels over the side of the boats, them living for a while, and then them fall to pieces somehow. So they need to have recruits or larvae arriving at these restored sites. So what we're trying to look at is see if we can use these commercial aquaculture locations and mussels that are growing in these locations to provide a larval subsidy to these restored populations to try and kickstart them and make sure that they do survive. Um, so to do that, that brought us to the overall aims of the entire research project. So it was to look at what the larval dispersal patterns of these green mussels, Pernocanaliculus, were in the Firth of Thames area, and to see how they, if we might be able to use those aquaculture populations to help um, provide that subsidy to restored populations. That's as well because those found populations. You don't really need to worry about them receiving larvae. They're always restocked. So they can only really need to worry about them acting as a larval source rather than receiving anything to keep themselves going. We came at this problem from two approaches, really. The first one was we came at looking where any muscle spat sitting throughout the Perth of Thames might come from. So if there's anything actually in this area, where might it have originated from? And through that we use trace elemental fingerprinting. And then we came at it from the other angle, from the opposite side, to thinking about where might larvae produce at aquaculture locations go to. 
So to do that, we use biophysical modeling techniques. I'm just going to go through some of the trace elemental fingerprint stuff first. Let's see what we had a look at. So in case you're not familiar with it, trace elemental fingerprinting is based on the fact that the chemical composition of carbonate structures, so like fish olive, such as we got on the left there, or bivalve shell, or shell material scales have been used, that the composition of these structures reflects the physiochemical differences in the environment that they formed. And because these structures are generally metabolically inert after they've been deposited, um, and they're deposited incrementally, if we can determine the chemical composition of structures that were formed early in an individual's life, we can match that up to a known map of elemental fingerprints and work out where they came from. So, for example, in this development of this green up muscle on the right we got here, this larval shell begins to form within the first 24 to 48 hours of its life. And that's retained as it continues to grow. So you can see on this, just before settlement, the same section of larval shell is retained. So as it settles, if we can work out where that material was formed, we can match back to its formation location. But before we could apply this in the study area, we had to do a bit of work first. So it's really important to know about the New Zealand aquaculture industry is this, what you can see is pretty much where it all starts. So this is a place called 90 Mile Beach, which is a 54 mile long beach at the Northern New Zealand. So it's at the very top, as you can see on the map in the corner here. And what happens is, from 80% of farmed mussels within New Zealand are washed out on this beach. So we get wild spat and washing up on the seaweed that's then loaded up onto these trailers. It can be, in some cases, it's a real mom and pop operation. Quite pretty low tech, considering these trailers get loaded up and then on that seaweed are these mussels spat. These then get sent around New Zealand to the various aquaculture locations where they're grown out on that long line system that, was, that I showed before. So you could think of it as the entire aquaculture stock of New Zealand really comes from one population. And this population, there isn't a huge amount of genetic diversity around it. So I wanted to make sure but that the fact that there's very little genetic diversity doesn't affect the composition of that shell material. So, as a lot of this is well, sometimes when you're looking at these relationships between the environment and the composition of shell, the relationships aren't always clear. So, it brought us to this this question that we wanted to make sure that genetic just to see how genetic differences can affect the composition of muscle shell. So the stock photo demonstrates it nicely. It boils down, again, right, to the age-old question of nature versus nurture. How much of that differences in the composition of shell is from nature, and how much is nurture? So what we did is we did two steps. We were really lucky to have access to a selective breeding program at Crawthorne Institute for these animals. So these are, we had multiple families that have been genetically isolated for at least three generations to see how these might differ, when, how the composition of their shell might differ when grown under identical conditions. So we took 10 of these families, spawn them and culture them under identical conditions until they were three months old. And then we looked at the composition of their shell material. And that was in two different locations. At the very umbo here, to ensure that that larval shell, to see how that larval shell is affected. And at the very edge, just to see how 
things might differ within a shell. So this is what we found with, these are some of the elements that we looked at. This isn't all of them, but it demonstrates some of the different findings that we had. So immediately you can see there that between, say, each, along the x-axis, we've got the different families. Along the y-axis is the amount of that particular element that was in the shell, ratio to calcium. And the two different colors represent the different locations within the shell. So immediately you can see that between these families, despite the fact that all of these individuals were grown under identical conditions, these different families differ in the levels of some elements, well, mostly elements, so manganese, magnesium, and barium, for example. You can also see that within the, sh within the shell, you saw a lot of difference. So generally that shell that was deposited earlier in the animal's lives, was much had much lower concentrations of each of those elements. Strontium's a really nice illustration here because you can see how there's relatively consistent differences between the locations within the shell and not a huge amount of difference between the families there, whereas others, it's all over the place. So, we found, had these, found these differences in the lab, but for the purposes of this work, we obviously want to get into the field and see whether it's actually applicable in the field. So using the same selective breeding program, we had access to six different families of these mussels, and they'd been growing at two different locations at the top of the South Island of New Zealand, for a period of four years. So these were pretty big boys and girls. Um, it's a 30 centimeter, one foot, I guess, ruler um, in this image here. So you can see that they had a decent size to them. And we looked at the composition of these shells at the very edge. And we ran these through a discriminant analysis just to see how they separated out. So these are the mean, the mean canonical scores for these shells that have grown at these different sites. So the different colors represent the different sites, red and blue, and the different shapes, and each of the crosshairs represents a different family. Immediately you can see that the two sites really separate out quite nicely. So you can see the blue and the red generally separate out quite well. But within there, we're also seeing differences between families, showing exactly that those environmental differences do play a larger role in those genetic differences. But those, these genetics do actually play a role. So the fact that we can differentiate between sites is the most important thing for this research. The fact that there's no, even if cases where there's no genetic variation or very little genetic variation, we can still pull the sites apart. But I also think if you're thinking at it from the opposite direction, right, where there is genetic variation, but there's no environmental variation, it might be something worth thinking about is looking at this shell chemistry to differentiate between, between genetically distinct populations. Um, obviously, there'd be a, a lot more to go into that, but it's a bit of a stroke your chin, stare at the sky sort of thing. But overall, that environment is the most important thing. That nurture, so where these were grown, and those genetic differences do have that effect. The next really unique thing that we needed to overcome before we could apply this trace elemental fingerprinting technique in this area was looking at the, some it's got to do with the nutrients. So the birth of Thames is fed the main freshwater inputs come into the south east south east here. You can see these rivers that I've circled in the in red. These rivers flow through one of the most intensely dairy farmed regions 
within the country. So there's a huge amount of nutrient runoff that goes into them. Uh, and you can see these, it's called the Hauriga Plains. So you can see all this farmland on the sides of this river, and it just flows out into this Firth of Thames area. Now, what happens is this causes huge phytoplankton blooms in summer, and as these die off, the pH of that water really starts to go down. So you can see here, this is a, this figure is a boat track of monitoring the pH at the end of March, I think it is, the 31st of March. And you can see how as you get into this Firth of Thames area, that pH just really drops out of it. Um, so it's similar to what you'd be expecting under high emissions IPC. It's, the pH is similar to what you'd expect due to ocean acidification under a high emissions IPCC scenario by 2100. But luckily it's just localized in that one area. If you're on a boat, you can actually see the water change and feel it, almost feel it when you're moving along. And you just really sink down into there. So we wanted to see if this low pH would affect how trace elements were incorporated into the shell material and to determine whether it was still applicable in this area or whether basically a high pH would wipe out any intersite differences. As well as giving us an insight into the applicability of this technique in future climate change scenarios. So what we did is we used just a single family from, we took one of those families from that um, previous study and we cultured this under current atmospheric conditions, ambient conditions, so 450 micro atmosphere CO2. And then separately we cultured another group under high CO2 conditions, so 1050 micro atmospheres. So that's the 2100 predictions from that IPCC scenario. We grew these guys out for three months and we had a look at their shell chemistry in two different locations. This is where we ended up. These are, again, not an exhaustive list of all the elements that we looked at, but these are some of the more interesting ones. So with some elements, strontium and boron, for example, you can see how at the edge of the shell, there were real effects bet between those two different conditions. So the different colors represent the different CO2 conditions and the different groups represent the two locations within each shell. So strontium and boron, for example, so these are elements that are often used to determine natal origins and level dispersal using trace elemental fingerprinting techniques, were relatively similar at the umbo, for example. Whereas when we got to the shell edge, the different CO2 conditions had a much larger effect. So that's quite important. If you're using this, this shell material at the umbo to determine where this shell material was formed, you can see how the different pH environments aren't really going to affect our ability to discriminate between these sites. Other elements, for example, though, um, cobalt and nickel, there's a huge difference between the different culturing conditions, um, so between the different CO2 conditions, whereas between the different, like, um, whereas between the different locations within the shell, there wasn't a huge amount of difference. So this CO2 affected the incorporation of elements into these, the incorporation of these two elements, for example, relatively evenly across the shell. So that just showed us exactly that most of the elements that we actually use to estimate population connectivity were unaffected by pH changes in this early shell. So we're good for the application of this technique within the study, within the study area. But the relatively consistent effects that CO2 had on different elements, 
So that gives the idea of using those as paleo proxies or pH reconstructions. And another stare at the scar, stroke your chin um, idea is to use different suites of elements to reconstruct different things. So you can reconstruct the movement history using one suite of elements and then reconstruct the pH at those locations that those were at using a different suite of elements. Okay, so that, those, are the, those were the two largest obstacles that we wanted to clear before we could actually apply these two techniques and see whether we, see whether we could determine these level of dispersal patterns. So that brings us back to where can larvae produced at these aquaculture locations go? The first thing we did was do some biophysical modeling just to help inform what we we're gonna do with our field study. A lot easier to have an idea of where to put things when you've got an idea of where things go. Hopefully that video is going backwards and forwards, it should be. So the biophysical model, we released particles at five sites throughout this Birth of Thames area. So these sites all represented locations at which aquaculture is currently taking place. Within this, within this harbour, yeah, there is a lot of aquaculture taking. Well, there is aquaculture taking place. So we released particles from there. It's semi-enclosed. You can see just on the outside of the second harbour, a little bit lower down, aquaculture is taking place. And then there were two. There's two locations here in this area that are the largest blocks within this area. So we released a lot of particles from there. And just across this Firth, we've got another area we released particles from that are small areas. So, and then we tracked them for up to five weeks. We let the particles settle, we gave them settlement behavior. So if they encountered suitable settlement behavior, uh, habitat, so that was either the, the coast or the seafloor between the ages of three and five weeks, they were able to settle. We used the open drift particle tracking software, which is an open source particle tracking software. It was quite cool and reasonably easy to use, I think. And with a base hydrodynamic model, Brom's model with 250 by 250 meter resolution. So to come to, back to this question, where can lava produce agriculture locations go? I guess the map on the right easily answers that question. So this is a heat map showing the likelihood of those particles released in that model settling at these different, settling at these locations. So the warmer the color, the higher the probability of settlement. Um, when you compare that to where these areas that used to be covered by these dense muscle beds, you can see how a lot of that area is actually really, there's a lot of overlap. Obviously there's a lot of places where it doesn't overlap, but I think it's the potential for these larvae from aquaculture to reach these other sites is actually there. But importantly, there's this area where, where there were dense beds until they were extirpated, extirpated back in the 60s or before the 60s. And you can see in that similar area, there is a reason, not a huge amount of settlement, but settlement is possible in that area. So it's always good when something in your model matches up to something else in real life. When it comes closer to real life, We've got this area here to the south of these large muscle farms in at the Wilson's Bay area, which is this area here. This, although there's no actual populations 
known in this area. There's actually some of the spat caching that does occur within this area of wild spat mainly occurs in this location just because that's where people find the highest amounts, highest spat supply. So that's also really good, the model matching up with something in real life. And finally, we've got this area here, which is called Dead Man's Point. Um, and there's actually, which you might not be able to see it that clearly in the picture, but it's an area of the densest or the highest settlement probability throughout this whole model. And that area does actually support a smallish, one of the few intertidal um, populations of these the species in this area. So I think that's really cool. It suggests that that populations might actually currently be supported by these aquaculture operations, which is always interesting. So when, you come, when we come into the restoration context, um, we're thinking about these hotspots would be places that the managers and the people that are leading the restoration efforts really need to start thinking about. Coming at this from the other side, implementing the trace and mental fingerprinting stuff that we developed earlier, we're trying to look at so we wanted to see where any settlers, any of this muscle span that settled throughout this area might actually come from. So with the micro, microchemical fingerprinting, the first step is to work out which, what shell that's formed at different locations actually looks like chemical, chemically, what the chemical composition of that shell was. So to do that, what we did is we went and collected seaweed and mussel spat from the west coast of New Zealand. So there's actually a year around, slightly further south, quite a long way further south from where the commercial harvests are. But nonetheless, there's a reasonably consistent supply of spat year round. And we transferred this in these in-situ culturing containers to the birth of Team's study site. So we sent these guys on a little holiday throughout when you when you're allowed to go on holiday and let them grow for three months. So when they went went in to these in situ culturing containers, you could clearly see what they looked like. They had this dark green appearance. And after growing within these in situ culturing containers for that three um, they were, they were put out for between four and six weeks. So you can see why there's a lot of aquaculture that occurs in that Birth of Thames area, just seeing how much these guys grew in that short length of time. And we determined the elemental composition where that red dot is, so just the most recently formed shell material. Where we sent these animals on their holiday, was a number of sites throughout that Birth of Thames area that we did, that model suggested there was going to be high settlement or onto agriculture locations. So you can see that these eight sites were spread, spread out reasonably throughout the Birth of Thames area. We then put these into a built a discriminant function model using these known, using these, this shell that was deposited in known locations. So this is, and this is the results of the, that model classifying shell back to the location that it was, that it was grown at. So overall, we had 75 fish percent classification success of using the model developed using the shell chemistry to reassign individuals back to their location which they were growing. There was, was some grouping of these reference fingerprints. So you can see these sites generally grouped together geographically. I'm not quite sure why this WP site grouped in with everything else, considering where you can see how far off, but it's a little bit further away from 
these other sites, which are located up here. There's the second grouping that we can see here of these two sites, which were located in a similar location. And then there was poor, sad, lonely coral run all over on its own. So this is suggesting that there's likely something going on with the environment at these locations that's helping to, to pull these apart, to try and work, to differentiate them based on that fingerprint. The next thing we wanted to do is where to use recent settlers that were floating around settled while we were developing those reference fingerprints to find out where they came from. So we put out artificial settlement substrates, the highly technical toughies that you can get, but they stopped making as well for some reason. And we collected throughout that time of those reference fingerprints we were developing, we collected individuals that had settled on, onto that, and we looked at the composition of that larval shell right in there. So you can see, we could see that larval shell, analyze the composition of it, and use that to assign those to one of those previously classified sites. Where do these guys come from? This is showing the proportion of settlers at each of those sites that we examined that had originated from each of the other sites. The size, well, first of all, the squares that are next to each of the sites represent the color that settlers from that site are assigned. So for example, this coral four site is yellow. So all the yellow on these um, pie graphs represents the proportion of individuals that originated at that site. The second thing to be aware of is the size of these circles represents the settlement rates at each site per day. So the larger the, larger the circles, the higher the settlement at those sites. The first thing that really strikes me and that backs up the previous model is just how well mixed these larvae are or how, just how well mixed things are. You have individuals that originate at a high number of sites actually moving to a high number of sites as well. So it's supporting that finding of that model that's showing that most of that area is likely to be able to receive settlers and to actually receive larvae. But you, and then we're also getting another thing that's quite important to think about is this WP site. This WP site received the highest number of settlers, so they had this highest settlement rates. But as well, you can see it contributes quite a lot of settlers to other locations throughout this Firth of Thames area. So when we're taking this back to that risk restoration aspect again, this is a site that really should be thought about a lot of doing these muscle translocations to try and establish a population here, which is likely to be more successful and sustainable in the long run because of those larvae that it might receive from other locations. And that might also help with providing, with increasing level of supply throughout this entire study area to try and do something to improve the conditions that we've got in there. Um, so the exact patterns that we found between the, um, the modeling and the trace elemental fingerprint technique, the pathways weren't identical, but the overall picture that we found was really similar. Both, both those techniques show that this area is well mixed and that larvae from these aquaculture sites can reach a large area throughout this Firth of Thames, Hauriki Gulf area, um, giving us ideas that this might be something that could be investigated into incorporating these aquaculture sites into these restoration efforts. So there is 
So this, this is especially worth thinking about when we don't need to restore those, when we don't need to worry about those aquaculture populations being self-sustaining. We do it all, humans take, take those mussels from up north, stick them on those lines, and hopefully they're gonna have the potential to spill over. Uh, it is also worth thinking about that this is a pretty unique situation, whereas the actual species that's been removed is the one that we're culturing. And it's effectively working in concert to bring back something that's been lost. There's other situations where if you're thinking about something like this, you have to think of the, the flip side is to avoid the escape of larvae from aquaculture. Um, and it's also best thinking about this fishing stopped in the 1960s and nothing's recovered since, despite the fact that we've got these aquaculture populations and that we are, well, I was, was finding settlement throughout this area. Why has there been no recovery? What's going on in there? Adults, so we're not sure it could have something to do with just conditions not being suitable for high enough reproduction or survival of larvae or post-settlement survival. Could also be a large part of it might be that that, those, that dredging just completely removed any hard substrate from that area. Especially considering the huge amount of sediment that flows out of that river at the bottom of the Firth of Thames. And it's just really fine sediment in there. So thinking about those dispersal opportunities and where those larvae from aquaculture might go. And just considering to restore just habitat with just settlement substrate to try and use natural, naturally produced larvae to be, bring things back. So I think there's somebody taking the mantle that I left, left behind in New Zealand and is looking into that. So hopefully there'll be something quite good to come from that at some point in the future. So thanks a lot for listening, but I've just got to acknowledge these people who have helped a huge, helped out a huge amount through everything, as well as the Moana project supported some of my collaborators, as did the Karen project, and helped out with a lot of things. So, and so thanks a lot for listening. If you've got any questions, type them in. You can email me as well. Um, and I look forward to meeting you in person from the shoulders down rather than just the shoulders up that I'm meeting everyone at the moment. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Craig. If anyone has questions, yeah, please type them into the chat box. Um, Craig, I'm gonna ask you a question that might kind of switch your brain for just a second, but I was hoping maybe you could also- Sorry, I can't voice. hear anything. Can you hear me now? Still can't hear? One second. Okay. Should be good now. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, I was just going to ask for you to kind of switch your brain for just a second from what you worked on in your PhD. Can you just spend a second telling us what you're working on now um, so that folks that maybe want to connect with you on that project um, might know what you're working on? Yes, sure. So here's a picture that I stole from my current, the current stuff that I've been working on just because I've been at it. So I'm currently working with Jessica Miller and the no group looking at salmon, salmon mortality um, as they move down the Columbia River into the ocean. So uh, currently what I'm working on right at the second is looking at odolif analyses to, to determine selective mortality as these salmon move down the lower Columbia River estuary into the ocean and what happens in that early ocean resident period. Um, and so I'm in that general area is where I'm going to carry on for the next two years. So as well, if anyone's got any ideas for things that I can look at incorporating these techniques with the salmon selective mortality and salmon survival in the California current, that's also something to come at me with. Great. I do have a question about the work that you uh, just presented to us. Chris Langdon was curious whether there were any predators that could explain um, the lack of recruitment in the harvest areas? Um, there's no solid evidence on that. 
Um, there is the idea of 11 and a half star purchases preying on restored beds is an idea that gets tossed around a bit, as is the idea that these dense populations are actually filtering out any larvae that might be produced. Obviously, there's that filter of fevers. Um, but there's no hard evidence as to what's going on there. Great. Uh, let's see if anybody else has questions. Give everybody just a second here. Um, I have a question. Uh, are there any known disease problems with the muscles in that area? Um, not really. There was a marine heat wave the year that I did this research in the field, which made things a bit difficult and a lot of stuff was dying. So a lot of the muscle farmers were farming. Um, there was just a lot of mortality of these muscles but there's no known diseases for these guys. Um, and then another question in this area, are there any marine reserves or anything that's like that? Uh, not, don't quote me on this, but not that I can think of off the top of my head. There's a internationally significant seabird breeding area um, in around here, um, but as far as I know, there's no real marine reserves. All right, last call for questions. Okay, and I think, oh, one last one. Uh, anyone using genetic markers to identify populations? Um, there's, well, the whole fact that they all come from the same place starts off by complicating that. But as we're advancing with the genetic markers and you can get sort of a high level of, they, as they're getting more sensitive, in other areas throughout New Zealand, there's an idea of applying these and using a similar, in a similar context to this in another area that is being looked into at the moment. Nice. All right, I think if anyone else has follow-up questions, um, they can contact Craig directly. He has his email up on the screen right now. Um, and just a reminder, we'll get this, um, uh, talk posted on the HMSC past seminars page, uh, hopefully soon. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see everybody that's linked in right now um, next week on next week's seminar. So thank you so much, Craig, for uh, spending some time with us today. Hopefully you're taking care of yourself and to everybody online. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot, everyone for coming. All right. Thanks, everyone. And Craig, you're just getting thanks coming in on the chat now. So. <laughs> okay, cool. I can't actually see the chat, but anyway, okay. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, oh, yeah, thanks for organizing that. No problem. Um, and just for your records, you had, um, I think, 33 total um, participants. So you can kind of keep track of that for your outreach stuff. Okay, cool. Choose to. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks again so much. I'm going to go ahead and log us off if you're all right. Yep. Cheers. Okay. Thank you. Bye now.